السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Whenever Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an was praised, he used to say, Allahumma anta a'lamu bi nafsi minni. O oh Allah, you know me better than I know myself. Wa ana a'lamu bi nafsi minhum. And I know myself better than anybody else knows me. So, O oh Allah, I ask that the praise they have given to me, that you make me better than that praise. And I ask that the sins that I have, that they don't know, that you forgive me those sins. And I ask that this praise that they do, you don't cause it to, to be against me on the Day of Judgment. I make that same dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah grant me ikhlas in all that I do and forgive my sins. And as I accept this award graciously and humbly, I pray that this is the beginning of bigger and better rewards. Because while I am humbled to accept this reward, the ultimate reward that I'm looking forward to is to be given my book in the right hand on the Day of Judgment. That is the ultimate reward. And it would be remiss of me to not mention my parents and all that they have done for me. For I would not be here today and I would not be the person that I am and I would not have undertaken the journey that I have undertaken had it not been for their upbringing and their tarbiyah and their love and their dedication. And for your information, my father is one of the founding members of Ikna and I am a part of the Ikna family. In fact, I was looking back the first Ikna convention I attended was almost 35 years ago as a teenager. So I used to be in the audience as a teenager. And slowly but surely, alhamdulillah, I have made my way over here. Always growing up in the Ikna household and always being a part of the Ikna convention. So alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, we thank Allah for every single blessing. Brothers and sisters, time is limited. And our talk today, the talk today is about the theme of the convention, faith and family and the future. And this is a very timely topic. The entire discourse in today's culture is about the family and what it means to be a family, what it means to be a husband and wife, what it means to be married. Subhanallah, brothers and sisters, this topic is completely problematic. Whatever you say, somebody is going to cancel you. Even if you don't say something, you're going to be canceled. Whether you speak, whether you don't speak, you're too soft, you're too liberal, you're too harsh, you're preaching this, you're preaching that. Why aren't you preaching? It reminds me of a hadith writ in the Sunan of At Tirmidhi that our Prophet said. Whoever desires to please the people by displeasing Allah will end up displeasing Allah and the people. But whoever desires to please Allah, even if it means displeasing the people, will end up pleasing Allah and yes, pleasing the people as well. So I ask that my intention in this lecture be to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it means that I get canceled by the cancel culture. I don't care about the cancellation of the cancel culture. I care about the cancellation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> Muslims, no prophet of Allah ever came to make the social norms of his time the social norms of the religion. Every prophet challenged certain aspects of the societal norms. Every prophet spoke out against evil that was rampant, that was politically correct for their times and places. No prophet would have won a popularity contest. No prophet would have won an election. Prophets by their natures, they preach the truth. And when you preach the truth, you make a lot of people irritated and angry. If we want to walk in the walk of the prophets, if we want to take 
upon the responsibility of the prophetic leadership, then we too, as scholars, as preachers, as du'at, we must preach the truth regardless of how bitter other peoples find that truth. So today, I will speak to you a truth about the family and a truth about gender reality and a truth about sexuality that might be problematic for some aspects of our culture. But it is not problematic to Allah Azza wa Jal. It is not problematic to our Sharia. We have to be very blunt and honest here. The sad fact of the matter, many of our next generation, many of those that are younger than 20 or around 20, they have found comfort in what we call the left of this country. And the reason why they found comfort in the left is obvious. The right began to hate us after 9-11. The right demonized us. The right created a bogeyman, invaded Muslim lands, said they should kick Muslims out of the country, wanted to ban the Sharia. And the left saw an opportunity. So they embraced us and they wanted to show their diversity by having the token Muslim, the token hijabi, that by showing that, hey, we're also all inclusive. So many of our youth jumped on to the leftist progressive bandwagon. And I'm not saying everything on that bandwagon is wrong. No doubt there's good and there's bad. But when they jumped on that bandwagon, wittingly or unwittingly, they absorbed some of the aspects of that bandwagon that go against our religion. So today I'm going to point out three issues that I want our youth to think about. Three aspects that I want the next generation to particularly be cognizant of because it is my estimation, my opinion, that these three aspects clash with our Islamic identity even if they're popular in certain circles of the left. The first of these aspects is this notion of identity politics. One of the main obsessions of the left is to identify yourself primarily as some type of minority and then to create a victimhood, a persecuted mentality around that identity. That identity primarily stems for the left from your culture, from your heritage, or perhaps even from your sexuality. And then once that identity is created, you are then obsessed with proving the entire world is out to get you. The entire world has always been perpetrating violence against you. And perhaps that might be true for some people, but here's the point, brothers and sisters. Our primary identity is not based upon the color of my skin. It's not based upon my ethnic origin. It's not based upon my nationality. Our primary identity is submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who chose us. He is the one who named us Muslims. Ana awwalul muslimin, the Prophet said to say in the Quran. I am the first to submit. He called you Muslims. As for identifying with culture, with ethnicity, with nation state, that is permissible insofar as we understand these are all neutral, all ethnicities are the same, all cultures, all nation states, there's no one that is better than the other. When you use identity politics to divide, when you use identity politics to say your nationality, your ethnicity is better, then that goes against the teachings of Islam. But it's not just ethnicity and origins that progressivism wants us to think about. One of the main markers of identity in this movement is one's sexual urges. And here is where we have to say bluntly, oh Muslims, feelings don't identify you. Oh Muslims, whatever your urges, whatever your sexual preferences, your humanity transcends that urge. Do not define yourself based upon your urge. Who created these divisions based upon your sexual preferences? Your humanity is far greater and far bigger than a base biological impulse. It is a mistake of the highest magnitude to define yourself based upon your sexual preferences. This is a figment of the imagination. We don't define our humanity based upon our sexual urges. Whatever our urge might be, whether it's haram or halal, the urge in and of itself is not sinful, but controlling urges that are harmful is the essence of Islam. Not every urge is healthy. Not every desire is good. And Islam comes to teach us right from wrong. We have to be careful, brothers and sisters. We are 
above defining ourselves by our biological urges. We are above carrying labels based upon what I want in the bedroom. No, not at all. We are human beings and we are Muslims. And as for our urges and preferences, well, those that are good and healthy, we develop them. Those that are not good, we control them and we, we ask Allah's reward. We expect Allah's reward to curb them. So this is our first point, brothers and sisters. We're not into identity politics. We're not into the victimhood mentality. We're not into this, oh, poor me, the whole world is against me. In my reading of the seerah from the beginning to the end, I have never once seen the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam complain to anybody else about how he was treated. There's a sense of self-dignity. There's a sense of working your own way to get out of the problems you're in. Even if you complain, your complaining should not be the end all and be all. Your identity Identity is more than just complaining and groveling. Stand up and do something. Work for a change. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fight legitimate fights to make the world a better place. So no to identity politics. The second aspect of progressive values that I find highly problematic is that overall the entire list of what we should be concerned with, overall the list that is presented to us from the progressive left some aspects on that list are good and halal. Others are ambiguous, and yet others are completely against the Sharia. But the entire list and the prioritization and the attempts to find solutions, that is not stemming from the Sharia. And we have to be very clear about this. Even when something legitimate exists on that list, for example, climate change, there is no question that yes, we should be interested in climate change. There's no question we should try our best to have healthier lives, to, to, to be green. There's no question we should save the whales. By the way, I'm a scuba diver. I've dived with whale sharks, so I love whales. But at the same time, at the same time, on our list of priorities, some people should take charge of that. But before saving the whales, let's save their fellow human beings as well. Let's be concerned about saving their souls as well. So brothers and sisters, the list might have aspects that are good and halal, but it is the prioritization, it is the emphasis, it is how we go about having solutions. Another example, racism. There is no question that racism is a problem we need to solve. But here's my point. How are we going to solve it? Malcolm X pointed out the only way to solve the racism of America is through the religion of Islam. The religion of Islam is the only way we're going to solve racism. So even when the problem is legitimate, like racism, the solution has to also be legitimate. You're not going to solve any of these problems unless and until you approach it from within the paradigm of the faith, the paradigm of the Sharia, the paradigm of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No matter how politically correct that list is, we look at that list through the lens of the Sharia. We prioritize based upon the Sharia and then we find solutions based upon the Sharia. That is my second point. My third and final point, brothers and sisters, my third and final point is that without a doubt, there are aspects on that list that completely contradict the fundamental values of our religion. Progressivism, the far left, whatever you want to call it, there are aspects of that movement that are completely at odds with our morality. And the theme of this year's convention, faith, family, and the future, is one such aspect. There is no question that the progressive left wants sexuality be, to be something fluid, something open, something to be not ashamed of. And in our religion, and from the Quran and Sunnah, and from history, and from biology, we learn and we state unequivocally that all of us were created from one man and one woman, and all of us were created in men and women. And the default is that a man marries a woman to start a family. The default, the, the reality, biological, historical, and faith-based is that there is no family except by a husband and wife, mother and father. There is no marriage except between a man and a woman. It doesn't matter who says whatever to the contrary. We will abide by our faith. In fact, intimacy itself, which is a blessing for the husband and wife, 
Our Sharia ah says this intimacy should be celebrated within marriage. It should be celebrated within marriage. But even intimacy within marriage, we should have haya, we should have modesty. Even the husband and wife don't talk about their privacy to other people. If this is the case with the husband and wife, then what do you think? Premarital, extramarital, same sex. What do you think of the pornography industry, which is one of the most profitable industries in this country. It is nothing but filth. It is nothing but destructive to humanity. This is not freedom of women. This is subjugation of women. And we say this unequivocally. The objectification of women, the sexualization of women. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, every religion has one defining characteristic. And our religion, its defining characteristic is modesty. That is our defining characteristic. O Muslims, do not give up our defining characteristic. Be firm to the principle of modesty. Make sure that you exude the family values of our Sharia. Because I say, and I say bluntly, looking at the reality of the world around us, looking at how everybody's capitulating, looking at how every other major civilization and major faith tradition has capitulated to what is going on around us. I say, we as Muslims are the last bastions of morality on earth. We cannot give up Islamic morality. Now, I have to also point out here, when we speak about morality and family values, our critics come and say, oh, you are preaching hatred. You know, when the Prophet ﷺ came to preach Islam, one of the things they said to him, you are preaching the breaking up of the family. You're breaking the family ties. Muslims, don't fall prey to this tactic. It's easy to accuse somebody of something. Where is their hatred? Any Muslim, listen to me carefully, any sister or brother, no matter what your urges are, even if they're halal or haram, the urge itself does not define you. If you come to me and you tell me, I have this urge, that urge, I'm battling that urge, I want to be a better person. You are my brother in faith, my sister in faith. I love you for the sake of Allah. There is no hatred. But when I preach morality, when I preach the protection of the family, I do so because I love you. If I really loved you, I would want you to follow what is good for you. If I really loved you, I wouldn't just let you go do whatever you wanted, especially when you're going to let a teenager decide what they want to be. We used to say for a teenager, what do you want to be when you grow up? They would say astronaut engineer. These days, what do you want to be? They'll think about another gender. No, 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 no. We are not going to allow you to inject hormones into 13-year-old kids. We're not going to allow you to take our children and change their biology. This is unnatural. It is unnatural and it is destructive to families. Muslims, Muslims, don't be deceived by this tactic. We are preaching love for the family. We are preaching protection for the family, love for the mothers and fathers, love for our children to be raised in healthy households, and most importantly, love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I conclude, Muslims, as I conclude, my message to myself and all of you, protect your families at all costs. Protect your families at all costs. Men, be positive role models for your children. Be positive fathers for your children. Women, be loving mothers for your children. Men and women, demonstrate positive masculinity and femininity because indeed there is something called positive masculinity and there is something called positive femininity. Sisters and brothers, make sure that you do your job to be fully worshippers of Allah, fully embody the prophetic model, demonstrate in your households what it means to be a mother and a father, a husband and a wife, so that your children can see with their eyes what the reality of a Muslim household is. This is the number one mechanism to protect the family, and that is to live the family in your own lives. Brothers and sisters, as I conclude, it is always my sunnah here at Ikna to conclude with a loud, unified takbir. I always do this for the last seven, eight years. But this year's takbir together is going to be slightly different because I want us to have a takbir that is demonstrating 
our genuine commitment to Allah when it comes to family values. I want to takbir from the depths of our heart that demonstrates that we don't care what society says. We're going to follow the religion of Ibrahim, the religion of Musa, the religion of Isa, the religion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A takbir that will shake the walls of this entire auditorium to show how much we love our children. A takbir that is meant to protect our families for the future. So I ask you to join me in a takbir coming from the depths of your heart. Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! One last time as loud as you can. Allahu Akbar! Zakum Allahu Khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.